and um, it, I was reminded of uh, something that I heard from uh, Richard Rohr, who said that in life we do two dances. We do a, a survival dance, and then we do a sacred dance. And you can't do your sacred dance until you've done your survival dance. In the first century, that survival dance was actually done in the first 13 years of their a person's life. They grew up real fast, and then they were considered an adult. For us, it takes 35 years, sometimes 40, sometimes later. Everybody's on a little different scale. But doing the survival dance is figuring out who you are. Being comfortable in your own skin, having an incredible sense of, of, of why you were put on this planet. It's, it, it sounds easy, but it's not. And, and, and we wrestle. And, and, and God is actually, actually committed to helping us get to, to our sacred dance. Because when you actually are free in who you are, and you're wearing your calling and your purpose and, and, and your personality and, and, and everything very, very comfortably, then you actually can dance. It's taken me years to, to, to going from being bilingual to, what's one language we I was asking somebody to Monolingual. Uni. Monolingual. You see, I speak the same language. We, 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 we live, and, and most of our socializing is with non-Christian friends. In fact, out here, we, the, the people that we spend most of the evenings with in, 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 are, are not believers. And, and I, can, I can speak the same language to them. I use the same words. I'm the same person with them as I am when I'm standing and talking to you. I, it doesn't change. I, haven't, I don't put on another language. And I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that when I was 25. I couldn't do that when I was 30. When I was in church, I had one voice. And when, 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 I, was, when I was doing sports, I had another voice. And God is so committed to, to, to you moving from your survival dance to your sacred dance that, that He's gracious to deconstruct you. He undresses us. You think you are somebody. That's why I'm, I, you know, I'm always nervous when somebody's 19 and they're getting a tattoo on their face. Because when you're 25, you're not actually going to believe that anymore. You're not going to... That tattoo is... is, is, is you, you, we grow and we change and we morph and we, yeah. and we become another person. But when you actually, when, he, when, when you're reconstructed, when He redresses you, He redresses you in His glory. He redresses you in your uniqueness. He redresses you. He wants to redress you being so ad absolutely, utterly secure in His delight. Yeah. Um, our, my son and Mike and Mel are here and, and, and they brought our, our grandkids are here. And, and, and I know you, you know I know you think this about your kids and about your grandkids, but you know my grandkids are delightful, and I spoil them a lot. And and, and, and and when they come to our house, we just we pour delight on them, and they act delightful. Do you see? If, if you understood, if you were open enough to the Father's love, that, that, that you wake up in the morning knowing that He's been waiting for you to wake up because He can't wait to talk to you. And to delight in you. Do you know how delightful you would walk around? You would skip and dance and twirl, pull your dress over your head, and look at that. Make sand angels, you know. You, you, you know that you would be th that that delightful, right? McManus in his book, The Artisan Soul, said that each one of us is a creation out of the imagination of the Creator. He says that we were imagined to imagine and we were created to create. We, I said it yesterday, we were designed different than the animals. And that the animals, beavers, beavers were created to make dams and bees were created. That's what they do all of their lives is they make hives. But human beings make futures. Yeah. We're created in such a way that that... that that we imagine the invisible and then we translate it into reality. Don't you think that is absolutely amazing? Yeah. You imagine something that you're not and then you create it. You turn it into, into something that is. And sometimes all you need is just a little inspiration. And I think inspiration so often is just the Holy Spirit whispering. Okay, this is a weird story, and uh, but but I was probably like 21 years old, 20 years old, and um, a pretty um, pastor.
passive lifestyle. I, I, I really like chips, and I really like pop, and I really like TV. And so you put those things together, and, 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 and you, you, you have quite a few wasted evenings. And, and I just thought, you know what, God made me this way, and so I'm just going to lean into who he made me to be. And, and I'll never forget this, because it, it, I don't even know, I, nobody, I didn't see it coming, but I was watching this program, and I don't even know if anybody, a couple of you might be old enough to remember it. It was Celebrity Olympics. It, was, it only ran one season. And um, Scott Baio, uh, you know, he was Chachi in Happy Days, for those of you who are old. Um, and Chachi. Um, and, um, and so he... He was in this swimming event and with a bunch of other stars and he dives into the water. You know how they do that? They dive in, they just loosen up and then they come out of the water and get ready to the actual, the actual heat. And I don't know if the, the camera went to slow motion or if my, my imagination went to slow motion. I don't know what happened, but he's pulling himself out of the water and he, he, he is absolutely ripped. He's got this unbelievable body. And something went off in my fat head that, that, that said, that, you know what, if I swam, I could look like that. That's, that's exactly what happened. And I'm not lying to you, I didn't even watch the race. I went and I got my Speedo. And then I went, thank you, yes. And, and, and I went and got a towel, and we lived in Calgary, and I drove to Renfrew Swimming Pool, and I bought a punch pass for 10 swims. Right there, all of this has happened probably within a half an hour. And they said the first swim is free. And I said, okay, when can I do that one? They said, right now. It was 9 o'clock. Right now. I said, there's nobody in the pool. She said, I know, it's like that almost every night for length swim. And so then I went out into the water and, then, and I started swimming badly. I, I realized I don't know how to swim very good. But the lifeguard is bored out of his mind. And so I said, how about some lessons? And he said, sure. I went every day that week. I went swimming every day. And the truth is, I went five days a week for the next three years. I went from 240 pounds to 175 pounds. Wow. Just swimming. And after you swim, you actually have the body of a god. But, but then everything settles, you know, like that. Because <laughs> you got all this blood pumping through you. It, it transformed the way it was, and that's what the imagination does. Somehow, in a weird way, I imagined what I could be, and then I created. And that's how God creates through you. You see, the universe began when God spoke. And it's really important to understand that God's voice is always in perfect harmony with His essence. And so when God speaks, it's always beautiful. It's always true. And it's always good. He spoke. He said, that, let there be light. And, and somehow, we, you know, we think that we just pull a switch, but somehow the moon and the sun became, came into perfect balance and perfect with, with the earth. And He said... Let their, um, then he spoke and the galaxies and the planets all, all became perfectly balanced, perfectly synchronized in this cosmic dance. It's amazing, don't you think? We're all moving. These are all moving parts. It's not like everything is just stationary. We're all moving thousands of miles an hour, hundreds of thousands of miles an hour. He spoke and there was air and there was oceans and there were animals. And then he looked at it all and he said, it's good. But then the most intimate that declaration of life is when he, he said, let's make man in our own image. Mm -hmm. And this was a very different kind of creation because it was, it was face to face, it was nostril to nostril, it was mouth to mouth, it was heart to heart, and he breathed into us the breath of life or the spirit of life, and then he said, it's very, very good. And do you remember I said that, that God's creed, he does everything out of, the, out of his essence? Do you know what that means to you and me? That means that you and I are simply God's voice wrapped up in skin. Because Jeremiah says that he saw us before we were conceived. He imagined us and he spoke us. And now we are. We are the essence of God. We are God's voice wrapped up in skin. In the, in the book of Genesis, um, it's, it's interesting when... Uh, we read about Adam and Eve. The Bible says they were naked and they were they were unashamed. 
and it's funny, we, we have a hard time wrapping our heads around that because we are such, we are so scarred and wounded by shame. You say unashamed and we just go, oh man, all I can remember is all, all the shame that I've experienced. But it's funny how you interpret, how you interpret uh, the scriptures uh, is it really altered by how you view the Garden of Eden. I began to think about this. What do you think Eden looked like? Like, did you have a picture in your head? Like, I always thought that the garden was about 40 to 80 acres. That, that's what I could see, you know? For, and, and it was an orchard. There were no other kinds of trees, just fruit trees, okay? And, 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 and the difference is, is that the cherries didn't happen in July and the apples in September. They all came all the time. And the grass, in my mind, in Eden, in my Eden, is all manicured. There's no long grass. And the animals are shiny. And they get along with each other. And they don't poop in the garden. Okay, there's no scat anywhere in the garden. And, and, and then the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in, in my mind, in my Eden, is this looming gray tree that kind of sprawls. It's, it's right smack dab in the middle of the garden. And, 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 and Adam and Eve, they walk by it every single day. The truth is we don't know how big the garden is or was. But we do know this. If you actually think about it, it was big enough for mankind to live for all eternity, multiplying regularly. It, for, you know what? It was big enough for that. It would have been that big. It was immense. And it's interesting that when you look at the command that God gave to, to, to Adam and Eve, all I hear when I think of the Garden of Eden is God saying, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just don't eat from that. But is that really the commandment that God gave? He said this, the commandment that God gave to Adam and Eve, he says, you may eat freely of every fruit in the, in the garden, except for this one. You know what God's command was to them? He said, eat freely. The whole thing is yours. Be free. Run around naked, hitting your bum, screaming, Nakash, Nakash, you know what, do that. <laughs> Eat freely, run for He said, this is all for you, so go, play, have fun. And by the way, the animals, whatever you want to name them, you can name them. Give them silly names, good names, big names, great names, but whatever you name them, that will be their name. Every choice in the garden is the right choice. Except for that one. Except for that one. And the tree that I put there, the one that you're not supposed to touch, you want to know why I put it there? Because I want you to know that you actually can choose love. You're free. You're free. You can choose life. That tree, that fruit tree in the middle, that one's there so that you know that you're not actually obligated to this relationship. I love you, and I'm going to keep loving you, but you don't have to love me back if you don't want. You are not, you're not a cog in a wheel. You're not a puppet on a string. You have the freedom to choose. And I don't want you to eat from that tree, but you can eat from that tree. But if you eat from that tree, bad things happen. And I don't know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden, but one day the serpent slid up to them. And he said, do you want to know why God doesn't want you to eat from the tree? Because if you eat from the tree, then, then, then you'll be like God and you'll know good and evil. And what's absolutely interesting here is, is that somehow, we don't know how many conversations the serpent had with Eve, but I'm thinking there were more than one. Because somehow over the course of the conversations he had with her, he convinced Eve that she wasn't what she already was. He said, you'll be like God, but God already said he created them in his image. And in so many ways, that's still the ploy of the enemy in your life right now. He's trying to convince you you're not what you are. He's trying to convince you that you're not loved when you are loved utterly. That you are not forgiven and you are forgiven. That you don't belong, but you actually do belong. And he keeps trying to tell you you're not what you are. But in that moment... In that moment in the Garden of Eden, a new voice entered into the narrative. It said, God doesn't have your best interests in mind. 
Because the best thing you could ever be is to be like God. And, 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 and the serpent, serpent actually convinced them they weren't who they were. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord. As he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to them, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, Who, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? It's a great question. God asks Adam. It's so important. He says, who told you you were naked? Who told you that? Is it possible that God is trying to, 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 to communicate this? That Adam, up until this point in, in your life, up this point in your reality, everything has been informed by my voice. Everything that you are, everything that you think has been formed by my voice. But now there's another voice. You've allowed another voice into your soul. You've allowed another voice to replace my voice. So who told you you were naked? Did I ever tell you you were naked? I've never said that. And from that moment on, the human race has, has allowed other voices to creep into our soul, yeah. to form us and to inform us. That which informs you, forms you. Clear? Yeah. That which informs your thinking. Nothing may shape what's happening at this moment more than the mindset you bring to this moment. Nothing may shape what's happening in your entire life more than the mindset you bring to this moment. And the mindset that you bring to this moment is primarily informed by the story that you tell yourself of who you are. So who told you you were naked? It's amazing to me how... For some of us, those other voices become so powerful, so authoritative, that we actually think it's our own voice. We actually, we actually call it ours. And while I'm aware that all of us have had good voices in our lives, and some of us have been especially fortunate to have voices that, that, that tell us we're loved and we're, and we're, and we're special and that validate us, but I also know that in this room right now, there are those of us in here who have voices that tell you you should be ashamed. There are voices in here that tell you that you are, you, you, you really don't have value unless you produce, unless you, unless you produce work, unless you become something. And because you're having a hard time becoming something, you, you, you have to find yourself without value. You're not enough. And the most destructive thing on the planet you see, Satan, he, he doesn't have to work so hard. I used to think that the devil's around lots of corners, like looking to kill us. He, he doesn't actually have to do this. He just has to embed a lie. Yeah. And that lie then takes foothold in, in, in our lives. And that lie then begins to shape us and form us and contain us beneath our privilege, beneath our calling, beneath who you are. And he convinces us you're not who you already created to be. I spoke to a guy um, a couple weeks ago. He's about 36 years old, and he, he's just—he's been in prison. He's—he's he's had lots of challenges, lots of addictions, lots of mess, several divorces, and and I—I uh, I, I said, "Wow, that's—you've been busy, you know." He said, and, and he said, he said, you, you know, you know, the the, the problem is. Uh, he said, I, I, I think it's a mental issue. He says, I think I have some kind of mental disorder. And I asked him, what, where, where, where did that come from? And we got to talking and he said, you know, when I was a child, I was rebellious. I was, I was just really, my parents had a hard time controlling me. And so my mom said, we're going to go to the doctor. He said, I was probably six or seven years old at this time. He said, we're going to go to the doctor. And he said, but I'm not sick. And his mom said, no, this is a mental doctor. And he said, that's all she said. And I went to the mental doctor three or four times. And he just sat there and he talked. He said, I got nothing of it. But every time I went to the mental doctor, I knew that somehow I was mentally defective. And he said, that idea, he said, I, I, and, and so I think, it's, it's, I think the doctor was right. And it's, it's troubled me my whole life. 
And as I was talking with him, I met him several times. Um, and I said, what if, what if that was a lie? What if a lie was inserted in, into your life that said you're mentally defective? It's, it's interesting when we create a theory of life or we believe a lie like that. And then we look at, we go through all of life looking to defend or to, to, to prove that theory of life. Right. And so he's been looking his entire life. And so when he acts up in school, he goes, oh, it's this. And when he fails, oh, it's this. And then when he gets into drugs, oh, it's this. And he goes to prison, oh, it's this. And all of it is this. And I said, what if that was a lie? He goes, how can... He said, that, that, that it means my, my entire life has been affected by that lie. And I said, exactly. And he's a Christian. And so we went back to... I said, what, what if... What if what if you were made perfectly, uniquely, who you are, God intended you to be? What if, what if we transfer, why don't we lay that truth over top of that lie? Let's suffocate that lie to death. See, if my friend that I met, if he was in a conversation with God, God would say, who told you you were mentally defective? Who told you? Did I ever tell you that? I never told you that. Whose voice did you let into your soul to reform you, to reinform who you are? Who silenced my voice and took my place? You see, uh, your, 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 your soul is expansive and we actually have room. Unlike the animals, we have room for many voices. Like I, don't, I actually don't think most dogs have more than one voice in their head. You know what? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure baboons don't have multiple voices in their heads. But we have capacity to have many voices in our heads. Voices of our parents. Voices of our, our grandparents. I was, I was saying to somebody, I cannot for the life of me, probably for the rest of my life, ever enjoy a dance floor. Because I have my father's voice in me telling me that that is the top of the slide that goes to hell. <laughs> that every sin that ever was committed on the earth began on a dance floor somewhere. That, that was the, that, and they, I don't know what they were thinking, but I got that my entire teenage years. And so here I am, 55 years old, and I, you know what, I love to dance. I, you know, we've been on, been in a lot of high school dances with, when I worked in a high school. And, and I would love to be free to float across the dance floor with my wife. I would just love that. I'd love to be able to be just dance like nobody's watching but I can't because I have this governor in my head it's my dad he's there and I, he's disappointed and, he, he, and I'm going to hell anyway if I do that and so, so I can't dance it's the voice of the guy who said to you that you're absolutely worthless and he walked away it's to the, the voice of the woman who said she'd never leave you she'd love you her whole life and she left and she walked away it's the voice of everyone who betrayed you. Have you ever noticed that when you're talking to somebody, you might say something, and all of a sudden their reaction is like a hundred times bigger than, than, than what you said. Yeah. Like if somebody makes a comment on your ears, or your ears, you know what, and, and, and what if you have big ears? And, and that person is not hearing your comment on their ears, they're hearing all of the comments that have been made about their ears and, and, and yours is being magnified to the hundredth power. And in so many ways, those voices, they damage your soul that way. Some of those voices are so loud that you actually can't hear anything else. So what is the story that you're telling yourself of who you are? What is the story? And you want to know something? You have complete power over what story you tell yourself of who you are. You can reprogram that story. You can get that story to line up with God's story for you. Because the story that He's telling you about you is that you have value. He's telling you that you're irreplaceable and that you are significant. Do you remember, um, I always think it's interesting, in 1 in, in uh, Kings chapter 19, Remember Elijah on Mount Carmel? Remember the big burn off they had, uh, that big competition they had, and and um, and, 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 and then um, and then Elijah, like he's so full of courage, you know what? He you know what he he, he kills seven hundred and fifty prophets of Baal and Asherah. He just slaughters them all. This ah, I'm the king of the world, you know. 
And, 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 and when, when that party was all over, you know, the queen, the wicked queen of the West, she, her name is Jezebel, she says, I'm going to kill you. Before today's over, I'm going to kill you. I'm so mad at you. And he freaks out. He's kai, 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 and he runs away. Like one woman, he kills 750 men. But one woman gives him the look. That look is so powerful. There's so much anointing and power and authority in the look. The, 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 the man of God runs. Okay, tail between his legs, and he runs. Finally, he gets tired of running. And then God comes to him. He's in this cave, and God comes to him. And, and he says, I want you to cover yourself here. I'm going to show you some things. And the Bible says, in the, and then the, God brings a wind that is so strong, it shakes the mountain. That's a, that's a big wind. And then there's an earthquake, and it shakes everything. And then there's fire. And it, 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 it's an all-consuming fire. And, and then God snuggles up to Elijah, and he says, Dude, what are you doing here? He says, you, you, you don't really, you know what, we just did the fire thing back at Carmel. So you don't really need fire. You don't need that. You don't need wind. and You don't need earthquake. I mean, I, he wasn't in any of those things. But he was in a whisper. And I wonder if what he was trying to say to Elijah is, you don't need all that stuff. All you need is to hear my voice whisper into your soul. And when I whisper into your soul, it will come alive in your imagination. And when it comes alive in imagination, then you can translate it into your life. All you need is my whisper. My whisper will give you the courage to live a great story. My whisper will inform you as to all that I'm going to do through you and in you. It's my voice that you need. And so God intensely pursues us. And we run. I don't know why we run. You know, it, it's absolutely amazing to me why we stay so busy so we don't hear his whisper. When I was 14 years old, and I'll close with this. When I was 14 years old, I, I, again, I was just 14 and and all I know is that I'm obsessed with boobs. And, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I'm 14 years old, and, I, and uh, I'm hormonally imbalanced. And uh, I'm 14 years old, and I have pimples, and I sweat a lot, and I don't wash. And um, so I'm typical of every 14-year-old, actually, all the 14-year-olds here, okay? <laughs> And, um, and so, uh, not really tuned into the Holy Spirit, it's all I'm trying to say, because I have other things distracting me, right? And, um, and I'm, my mom, and, we're, we're Baptists, right? And my mom and I sneak out to this Pentecostal church because there's some meetings going on. And we go to this thing, and we never seen anything like it at, ever. Oh, you know, like, like it, it was actually kind of cool. And, it was that first assembly in Calgary, and, and uh, we, we kind of snuck into the back because we didn't want to know anybody that we were Baptists, right? Because we're they're, they're, pr they're, they're pretty demonstrative, and I thought that they might cook us or something. And, uh, and, and then, then uh, the worship was bigger than I'd ever seen before, and that was all pretty cool. And then the pastor comes up, and he gets everybody to sit down right in the middle of worship, and he's looking over the audience, and he... He's, he asks my mom and I to stand up. I'm thinking, how do they know? Like, how do they, like a bee tattooed to my forehead? How do they, I can't believe this is terrible. And he asked my mom and I to stand up. And then he says to my mom, he said, your son, that's your son? And he said, yes. And then the minister starts to weep. He says, oh my God, he said that he's called to preach. He said, the hand of the Lord is on him to preach his word. You can sit down. And then I sat down, and it was like I had just been run over by a semi-trailer. Like it was, and from that day on, that was pretty big, right? But from that day on, that word stuck into my soul. And it's that word that moved to my imagination. That's that word. You see, until you actually translate it into reality. 
It, it, it haunts you. Some of you have a calling that you haven't stepped into, and it's, and it's this, 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 this gnawing ache in your soul until you step into it, until you dare take the courage to take that step. And, and, and so struggled a lot, but all the while that was there. And I can tell you this, probably I'm most alive, I'm most alive when I'm doing my sacred dance. I, 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 don't, I don't need to make lots of money. That's not what makes me alive. What makes me alive is when I get to care for people, when I get to encourage people. And, and whether that's counseling or just coaching or encouraging or speaking, I'm most alive when I'm doing that. It's because that's what I was created for. So what's the story that you tell yourself who you are? Amen. That's it.